The United States Handball Association welcomes you to the Handball Hall of Fame. Come on in and learn about the game. From one wall to three wall to four wall, you'll experience the perfect game of handball in all its different forms and glory. For nearly half a century, the USHA has been dedicated to preserving the past while building a future for the perfect game. And now we're proud to showcase the great players, personalities, and historic events that have shaped our handball heritage. In 1919, Bill Ramp won the first officially recognized national championship under the auspices of the AAU. Ramp represented the Los Angeles Athletic Club in everything from water polo to basketball and track. But handball was his main game, and Ramp's reputation was as a hustling, hard-hitting, clean-playing handball machine. In 1920, Max Gold, another Los Angeles Athletic Club member, went through the national tournament without a loss. He was the first champion to suggest that the rules be changed and that more hinders be called when he said, I think there should be a few changes to the rules. Hinders should be decided by a referee if the opponent is hit by the ball when going towards the front wall. The next year, the title was claimed by Carl Hedge, a conditioning fanatic from St. Paul, Minnesota, who wore his opponents down with speed and stamina. It was at this 1921 tournament that the players agreed upon the standardizing of the rules of the game, particularly concerning hinder calls. In 1922, Art Shinners used the home court advantage to win at the Milwaukee Athletic Club, where the matches were played for the first time on 20 by 40 courts. Shinners' trademarks were his strength, stamina, and the fact that he played barehanded. 1923 saw a courageous comeback for Joe Murray, the Olympic club representative who came back from his first game loss to win the second game in a 21-20 thriller. Murray won the final game 21-6 over a man who was destined to become one of the game's true legends. That man was Maynard Laswell, the first multiple winner of the national handball title. For the next three years, Laswell dominated the game with a back wall drive unrivaled in its power, combined with superb overhand placement, a sidearm fly kill, and great conditioning. Just how long Laswell would have dominated the game is unknown because he retired after his third title in 1926. In 1927, Big George Nelson of Baltimore stunned the handball world by introducing hook serves to the national tournament going undefeated and leaving a trail of rattled opponents behind him as he served his way to the national title. But the next year, Nelson met his match when Joe Griffin defeated him in the final in three tough games. Griffin, a Detroit native, combined poise, control, strategy, and a deadly backwall kill to methodically take apart his opponents. The next three years belonged to the great Al Banuay, perhaps the most graceful and exciting athlete handball has ever seen. One sports writer said of Banuay, he is the greatest champion in his chosen sport that I've ever seen. Greater than Babe Ruth in baseball. Greater than Bobby Jones in golf. Greater than Jack Dempsey in boxing. Banuay's career was cut short by a short-lived professional boxing career that caused him to be banned from AAU competition, which at the time was the only game in town. Al Banuay was truly one of the game's giants. Another colorful champion was Angelo Trulio, master of the large courts, who thrived on long rallies in a regimen that included 20 games a day. He was a cover boy for strength magazines and held the amazing distinction of winning national titles 14 years apart. Slender Sam Atchison was another multiple winner, taking the title in 1933 and 1934. Atchison, a wiry, speedy perfectionist, saved his best play for the YMCA championships where he was virtually unbeatable from 1930 to 1945. 1935 ushered in the era of Joe Plattick, who won seven consecutive titles and staked his claim as handball's greatest champion. Plattick was the total package, strong, tireless, ambidextrous, fiercely competitive and relentless in his devotion to the game. In 1937, when Joe was at his peak, he toured the country playing exhibition matches against all comers, he played 136 separate games in 21 days in 17 clubs in 13 cities and 9 states, covering 3,000 miles on the trip, and he didn't lose a game in singles or doubles. Joe Plattick. He just may have been handball's greatest warrior. Plattick's chief rival during this period was Jack Clements, who took advantage of Plattick's stint in the Navy to take the 1942 championship. Clements totally dominated play. His opponents averaged less than five points a game, an all-time national tournament record. 
In 1944, Frank Lefty Coyle, a doubles specialist with numerous national doubles titles, upset Joe Plattick in the first and only final featuring two left-handed contestants. Using a now legendary strategy, Lefty lobbed every serve to Plattick's right hand, frustrating the great champ and giving Frank Coyle the greatest upset in nationals history. Another great champ, Gus Lewis won consecutive titles in 1947 and 1948 and probably would have won more except for numerous physical ailments. Gus had a reputation as a control player with a great fly kill and blazing speed. If a vote was taken to determine the greatest all-around handball player in one wall, three wall, and four wall, the winner would probably be Vic Hershkowitz. Vic won six one wall titles, nine three wall titles, and three four wall titles. With the game's greatest power serve, two-handed offense, and great court coverage, no other player has so thoroughly dominated the entire sweep of handball competition like Vic Hershkowitz. One of the game's strongest players was 1950 champ Ken Schneider. Ken displayed amazing speed and court coverage, anticipation, and a deadly backwall shot to become one of the game's toughest players in the 50s. He was also a terrific sportsman who went on to become one of the USHA's most popular national commissioners. In 1951, Walter Pleakin won the first national tournament held by the USHA that marked the transition of handball administration from the AAU to the USHA. Pleakin, one of the cagiest players ever to grace a court, beat the great Vic Hershkowitz despite playing on injured legs that would soon end his handball career. Big Bob Brady took the 1953 nationals in Houston, utilizing the Irish whip with his right hand and a stiff punch with his left. Brady would run his opponent from side to side, rarely making an error and tiring his opponent in the process. He is known as the game's fiercest competitor. The mid-50s saw the emergence of Jim Jacobs, who would eventually win six national singles titles and dominate the game with such flair and charisma that a 1979 poll by Handball Magazine selected him as the greatest four-wall player of all time. Jacobs was the complete player. Strong, fast, tireless with two great hands and a concept of the game that brought it into the modern era with the advent of the ceiling shot. Nobody epitomized the game of percentage handball like Jim Jacobs. The late 50s saw the emergence of another star, Johnny Sloan, the little general. Sloan achieved national stardom in doubles by the age of 18 and was only 22 when he won his first of three national singles titles. He was quick, smart, and owned the complete game. With three singles titles to his credit, little Johnny Sloan was one of the game's giants. Oscar Obert emerged as a four-wall champion after years of success in one wall and three wall. He had one of the most lethal right hands the game has ever seen and played with a fire and tenacity that thrilled galleries and struck fear into the hearts of his opponents. A chronic bad back kept him from even more titles, but Oscar Obert remains one of handball's most memorable champions. Handball's flashiest champion was Paul Haber, who won five championships in six years between 1966 and 1971, and influenced the game in much the same way that Jim Jacobs revolutionized it in the 50s. Haber was quite simply the greatest ceiling shot artist the game has ever seen, with the ability to drop it into either corner from anywhere on the court. He also thrived on adversity, and often argued with his opponent, the referee, and even members of the gallery. He may not have won any popularity contest, but Paul Haber was certainly fun to watch. In 1968, Stuffy Singer won his only national singles title. Stuffy was one of handball's most gifted athletes, with speed, quickness, power, and smarts. He was also one of the sport's most injury-plagued champions, enduring several knee operations, which kept him from joining the elite pantheon to which he should have belonged. The 70s belonged to Fred Lewis, a player with an almost perfect balance of offensive and defensive skills. He was known as Steady Freddy, and his shot selection may have been the best ever. Quite simply, he did not make errors, and could run even the most well-conditioned athletes into the ground. Lewis won six national titles, and of all the champions, he may have been the most well-liked for his sportsmanship on and off the court. Terry Muck's lone championship came in Austin in 1973. Terry Muck is considered by many to be the fastest player ever to step into a handball court. He was a fearless two-handed shooter who relied on his speed to cover up any mistakes in shot selection. For many handball fans, Nadi Alvarado is the greatest player who ever lived. No player has won more national singles titles and more professional tournaments than this cat-like athlete whose nickname was El Gato. 
He won the national championship 11 times, and not with the cool, balanced attack of a Fred Lewis or a Jim Jacobs, but with an offensive fury and a desire to be the best that simply made him invincible for a decade. It's fitting that Nadi relinquished his crown in 1989 to his protege, Alfonso Pancho Monreal. Pancho imitated Nadi in many ways, but has developed his own style of play, which incorporates more drives to keep his opponents off balance. Alfonso was the heir apparent to Nadi's throne, but an invasion of younger players into the game made his reign short-lived. In 1991, John Bike became the new champion and one of the few lefties to win the national title. And what a left! Only a handful of players have ever approached John Bike's awesome power, and he moves surprisingly well for a big man. John Bike is a tremendous athlete, a physical specimen who hits the ball harder than any player before him. 1992 saw the emergence of another young star, Tati Silvera, a hard-hitting 20-year-old who forsake the defensive game to rely almost solely on his power, speed, and quickness. A knee injury has sidelined Tati in 1993, but handball fans expect even more from Tati in the future. Our final champion, David Chapman, holds the distinction of being the youngest man to ever win the title, doing so when he was only 17 years old. He combines control, shot selection, and some of the steeliest nerves ever to apply constant, relentless pressure to his opponents. Many predict that, barring injury, David will become the greatest champion the world of handball has ever seen. This sampling of our national champions does not do justice to the other great players, particularly in one wall and three wall. But it does illustrate the heritage of our game and the bright future in store for it with players like John Bike, Tati Silvera, and David Chapman. But handball is a game which depends not only on its champions, but on the thousands of club players and junior contenders, both male and female, and on the volunteer work and donations from members of the United States Handball Association. We've enjoyed a century of growth. Now it's on to the future for the world's greatest game.